Hey everyone, this lesson is on cellulitis and erysipelas. In this lesson, we're talking about what the differences between these two conditions, what causes these two conditions. We're also going to talk about how we can determine these conditions by their signs and symptoms. And we're also going to talk about the differences in treatment and some of the complications. So cellulitis and erysipelas are both skin infections with bacteria, particularly bacteria of the streptococcus and staphylococcus genus. So with regards to streptococcus, group A strep or GAS is the most common. And with staphylococcus, Staphylococcus, generally speaking, we talk about Staphylococcus aureus as the cause. So it can either be group A strep or Staphylococcus aureus. So here's a picture of Staphylococcus bacteria. Cellulitis and erysipelas are both described as being erythematous, edematous, and having warm skin. So erythematous, they're red. Edematous, they're swollen or swelled. And warm or hot. So they're hot to touch. And both of these conditions are almost always unilateral. So if you see bilateral cellulitis or erysipelas, you want to think about another diagnosis because oftentimes it's only going to be unilateral. And generally speaking, the lower extremities are the most commonly affected. Now, there are certain risk factors for getting cellulitis and erysipelas. These include anything that causes a break in the skin. So a puncture, a scratch, anything like that can lead to the defensive barrier in the skin being broken and bacteria getting in and then in causing an infection. So in trauma, other skin inf conditions or other skin infections can lead to a super infection with cellulitis or erysipelas. The second risk factor is inflammatory skin conditions like eczema. Again, this is very similar to the first one where there is an issue in the barrier protection of the skin due to an inflammatory skin condition. This can lead to bacteria seeding in or infecting the skin easier. The third risk factor is edema from venous insufficiency or impaired lymphatic drainage. The fourth risk factor is immunosuppression. So this makes sense. If you don't have a good immune system, you're not going to be able to fight off a skin infection before it can take over. And the fifth risk factor is obesity. So this can all tie in together with immunosuppression and other skin conditions or other infections that can lead to the cellulitis and erysipelas infection. So we're going to look at an overview of cellulitis first. Cellulitis is a skin infection, like we mentioned before, that involves deep dermis and subcutaneous adipose tissue. Very important to recognize and understand. It involves deep dermis and subcutaneous adipose tissue. It's a deeper infection. So if you look here, we can see the different layers of the skin, epidermis, the dermis, subcutaneous tissue. So you can see that cellulitis extends all the way down through the dermis and subcutaneous tissue. And then here's an image of cellulitis. Cellulitis in general has an indolent course in onset. So it is kind of slowly comes on. It slowly develops over time and usually it's over a few days. The symptoms can be localized, but you can also see regional lymphadenopathy in the area of the infection. And we can describe it as non-purulent or purulent cellulitis. With regards to non-purulent, we think about beta-hemolytic streptococci as the cause of the infection. It can be MSSA as well, but we generally think about streptococci with non-purulent cellulitis. And with purulent cellulitis, we think about staphylococcus aureus. So this is kind of how we can distinguish or somewhat determine or narrow down which bug is causing the infection by if it's non-purulent or purulent. Now we're going to look at an overview of erysipelas. Erysipelas is also a skin infection, but it involves the upper dermis and superficial lymphatics. So whereas cellulitis is an infection of the deep dermis and the subcutaneous adipose tissue, erysipelas is an infection of the upper dermis and superficial lymphatics. It is more of a superficial skin infection. So again, when we look at the layers of the skin, we see that erysipelas affects the epidermis more and maybe a bit of extension into the dermis, but more so it's a superficial infection. It has an acute onset, so it's abrupt onset. Generally, we can see fever, chills, and malaise because of this abrupt onset. The skin lesion in erysipelas is clearly demarcated. So you can see an abrupt change between the skin lesion and the non-affected skin beside it. And the skin lesion is often raised. So you can see in this image here, it's clearly demarcated along the border and it's a raised infection. Erysipelas is always non-purulent, so it's never purulent. And if there is involvement of the ear, if you have a reddened skin infection of the ear, it's always erysipelas because the ear doesn't contain deeper dermal tissues. And when the ear is involved, it's an infection with erysipelas, we call that Millian's ear sign. So a summary of the similarities and differences between cellulitis and erysipelas. So cellulitis is a deep dermis infection that involves subcutaneous adipose tissue as well. It has an indolent onset, so it's a kind of slowly builds up 
and results in the infection and it's more localized, more localized symptoms. Erysipelas is an upper dermis infection, so it's more superficial. It involves superficial lymphatics. It has an acute onset, so it's more abrupt, and it has systemic symptoms like fever, chills, and malaise, and it's always non-purulent, whereas cellulitis can be purulent or non-purulent. The similarities between cellulitis and erysipelas are that they are both skin infections that are caused by bacteria, usually streptococcus or staphylococcus. So streptococcus or staphylococcus can cause either of these infections. So that is the similarity between these two. They are also similar in the case that they are both erythematous, edematous, and warm skin, but otherwise they are different in the ways we've just mentioned here. So how do we make a diagnosis and how do we treat cellulitis and erysipelas? Diagnosis is often a clinical one. It's based on the presentation, history, and laboratory findings. And you might be thinking, okay, can we culture the bacteria to figure out which one it is? Well, it's not helpful because if we try to culture with a swab on the skin, we're just going to pick up normal skin flora, and that's not going to help us with our diagnosis. So there are times when we can get cultures of debrided material, and some blood cultures may be warranted in certain circumstances, but oftentimes it's just a clinical diagnosis and we leave it at that. So once we make the clinical diagnosis, how do we treat it? If it's an abscess, if you were able to find a fluctuant uh, mass where there is cellulitis, you want to have an incision and drainage. And then there are circumstances when you use antibiotics after the incision and drainage as well. With non-purulent cellulitis, we typically use PO cephalexin or IV cefazolin. In the case of purulent cellulitis, we're covering for Staphylococcus aureus species, and in the one we're worried about is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA. So we treat with antibiotics that cover MRSA, PO, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole or septra, clindamycin or tetracyclines. If the individual is systemically toxic, they have a fever, they're really not doing well, we can then give them IV vancomycin or daptomycin. For erysipelas, we're covering for group A streptococcus. So penicillin, moxicillin, cefazolin, ceftraxone are all options. Other considerations of having cellulitis particularly includes recurrent cellulitis. Recurrent cellulitis has certain risk factors. Generally speaking, they're similar to risk factors we talked about earlier in the lesson. One of them is obesity. Second one is immunosuppression. A third one is chronic vascular insufficiency, lymphatic insufficiency, and other skin conditions. So having tinea pedis, having any macerated skin, anything at all that can lead to seeding of bacteria into the skin again. And any of these things, obesity, immunosuppression, you can think about uh, type 2 diabetes, as a risk factor for recurrent cellulitis. So you may see cellulitis that keeps coming back, coming back, coming back. These are the risk factors for that. And the complications of cellulitis, if you were to continually have recurrent cellulitis or long-standing cellulitis, it can lead to osteomyelitis, so infection of the bone, bacteremia, so you can get bacteria in the blood, endocarditis, so bacteria in the blood can then seed onto the heart and cause an infection inside the endocardium of the heart. Even sepsis can occur and toxic shock syndrome. So a lot of bad complications can occur with long-standing cellulitis. And I mentioned before that streptococcus and staphylococcus species are the most common causes of cellulitis and erysipelas, but I don't want you to leave off with just thinking those are the only types of bacteria that can cause these infections. For example, other cellulitis bacteria, as I mentioned before, most common are beta hemolytic, strep, and staph aureus, but there are others depending on the situation and the environmental exposure. One consideration is if the individual is exposed to fresh water. Think about the bacteria Aeromonas hydrophila. If the individual is exposed to seawater, you can think about the bacteria Vibrio vulnificus as the cause of the cellulitis. If the individual is in a hot tub or exposed to hot tubs, you want to think about the bacteria Pseudomonas aeruginosa as the potential cause, although generally speaking this causes another type of skin infection known as folliculitis. We'll talk about folliculitis in another lesson. If the individual is exposed to fish, they have cellulitis, they were exposed to fish, think about bacteria of the genus Erysipelothrix. Rusiopathia is usually the species. For bites, if an individual was bitten by a human, you want to think about Iconella corridons or other oral uh, anaerobes. If it was an animal bite, you want to think about the bacteria Pasteurella multicida or Capnocytophagia canamorsis. If it was a tick bite, we want to think about Borrelia burgdorferi, so the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. So these are all different types of bacteria depending on environmental exposure or different situations if there was a human bite or animal bite or a tick bite. So again, most common bacteria that cause cellulitis is beta hemolytic strep or staphylococcus aureus. If they were exposed to fresh water, 
think about Aeromonas hydrophila. If they're exposed to seawater, think about Vibrio vulnificus. Hot tubs, think about Pseudomonas. Exposure to fish, think about Erysipelothrix. If they were bitten by a human, think about Iconella corridans. Animal bites, Pasturella multicida or Capnocytophagia canamorsis. And if they were bitten by a tick, think about Borrelia burgdorferi. So if you want to learn more about other skin conditions, please check out my dermatology playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel. And as always, thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.